Good afternoon. Um, we're very fortunate today in having as a uh, guest of the Associated Students, Mr. Sheldon Leonard. As you all know, he's a TV producer, comedian, director, actor. Uh, among his current interests right now is I Spy, Bill Cosby, and uh, uh, Mr. Culp. Uh, he's also associated with Danny Thomas. He's going to be speaking for a few moments. We're going to be very, very informal. Following his uh, discussion, uh, we'll go straight into questions and hopefully answers. Mr. S Mr. Leonard. Thank you. Uh, the, on, as we walked in, I was asked whether I had a topic for this talk, and uh, uh, it was hard for me to answer that question because the topic actually is a, uh, uh, a good word for sponsors. Now, this is practically unprecedented in the... Uh, <laughs> the mass communication media, to say anything good about the sponsor. But we are discovering right now, as we are in a time of turmoil and change in television, we are discovering that actually the sponsor was a pretty good thing and that his absence is turning out to be a pretty bad thing because television is reaching a state in which I may soon turn my back on it. Not that this is going to cause NBC to go into bankruptcy or anything, but uh, uh, because of the color it may, the coloration it may give our discussion, uh, I am telling you that. I am telling you that, that uh, I'm despondent about what's happening in television. I see no immediate chance of it getting better. For years, I avoided uh, any involvement in anything but television. I dedicated myself to it. I, I wasn't interested in doing feature pictures, doing theatrical film, or doing a play on Broadway, or any of the other intriguing things that one can do in my profession. I wanted to do television. I thought that I understood it. It had been kind to me, and I thought it was going someplace. <coughs> I think it still will go someplace, but I haven't the time to wait for it now. Because of the things that are developing as a result of the abdication of the sponsor. Now, let me digress for just a moment to say that the, this loosely related, the, 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 what we will call my topic, is primarily intended to um, spark discussion later, to provoke questions from you, questions which I will undertake to answer to the best of my ability. Uh, it is that, and whatever you find provocative or whatever you dispute in what I am about to say, please feel free to challenge me on it later. Uh, let me, let me uh, make clear what I mean about the chaos that's developing as a result of the disappearance of the sponsor. First of all, let me establish the fact that the sponsor has, in fact, practically disappeared from television. He's been replaced by a phenomenon called the affiliate, the affiliate station. Now, I don't know how specialized your knowledge of television is, and I don't know to what extent it's necessary for me to explain things, terms like affiliates and so on. I'm going to play it safe by, by giving a, 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 a superficial explanation of some of these obscure terms as I go along. And if I am redundant, if I am saying things that you understand, please forgive me. Uh, the affiliate is the station which makes up uh, a network is made up of affiliate stations plus, the, a, ver plus a very small number of what they call O and O stations, or owned and operated stations. As a matter of fact, the only actual stations owned by the NBC network are five. Uh, I think they are Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Philadelphia, perhaps one other. Uh, all the rest of the 200 odd stations that make up the NBC network are affiliates. They are stations which subscribe to the service which NBC offers. NBC supplies them with programs, and they pay a fee, a percentage of their of their uh, their gross income. Uh, for this programming which NBC supplies. That's what made up a network. Uh, up until relatively recently, uh, your success or failure as a programmer, the success or failure of your program depended on what kind of a network, the what kind of a, uh, a lineup of affiliates the network could supply to you. Uh, 
again, a digression. I don't know if it has any place here, but whenever I talk about station lineups, I remember the the great fears that prevailed when I spy went on the air, when there was a, a, um, a great fear that we would not be able to get a station lineup for it because of the presence of a Negro in the cast. They, there was a deep conviction that the southern stations would defect, that they would not take the program. Uh, this was about three years ago, and at the time I remember uh, s uh, telling the network people with all the assurance at my command that I thought those fears were totally uh, misplaced because the climate had changed in the last few years. I thought they were, didn't have anything to worry about. And it turned out that I Spy was the only show on any of the three networks that had a 100% station lineup. The only show in which all of the stations available, all the affiliates available, subscribed and took it. This was not true of any other show on the air in its first year and its, in its subsequent years. Uh, back from that digression. Uh, the affiliate, as I say, loyally took what the stations offered him until recently. Now he no longer does so. Let me leave that statement where, it's, where it rests for a moment and approach it again from another direction. Years ago, when I first came into television, by years ago I mean 15 or 16 years ago, when I first came into television, the most important figure in the whole picture was the sponsor. He liked your show or he didn't like it. He bought it, he put it on the air, he went to the network with the package under his arm and said, I'd like to buy 8 o'clock Monday night for this. And he was welcomed with uh, much bowing and kowtowing, and uh, he dominated the whole thing. Through him, his, his lieutenant, the agency, the uh, agency that, that handled his account, he uh, acquired a certain reflected glory from the importance of the sponsor. The two of them dominated television, as they had dominated radio before this. Uh, the quiz scandals started a major change in that situation. The quiz scandals resulted in a rebuke from the FCC to the uh, <coughs> networks who said, what do you mean you didn't know what was going on in your network? What do you mean it was the sponsor's fault that they were hoodwinking the public and, and uh, rigging these contests? It's your store, it's your grocery store that this merchandise is displayed in. You must accept the responsibility for it. And so the networks uh, didn't wait long to accept that responsibility, and they pushed the sponsor out of the area of program selection, and they said, we will no longer take the programs as you bring them to us. We will tell you what programs are acceptable in this time spot, and you can buy into them or not as you wish. The first step in the demotion of the sponsor. However, there were still a few giants, like Procter & Gamble and General Foods, with whom I was happy and lucky enough to be associated. And they, through their continuing influence, managed to get certain controversial shows on the air and to keep them on the air. In the period up until now, the, I, have, I have brought you to the point at which this industry stood until a couple of years ago. In other words, the industry was, until a couple of years ago, dominated by the successor to the producer, that is, by the network program executive or the network head. They were the ones who made the decisions, who decided what was going to be on the air and what would stay on the air. Things had still uh, not become bad. I was content with that situation for reasons which I'll now make clear. Uh, the kind of programs I chose to do needed time on the air. Uh, they didn't come on strong. I didn't, I, I'm not, uh, I, don't, I don't believe in novelties. I don't believe in gimmicks. There was nothing highly exploitable about, about the kind of relatively low-key shows that I chose to do. Their success depended on being on the air long enough to make friends. Shows like Danny Thomas and Andy Griffith and Dick Van Dyke and, and uh, Gomer Pyle, etc. All of these depended on being on long enough to create some sort of rapport between the people on the screen and the audiences. I was successful in keeping them on the air in spite of the fact that they all had very slow starts because I was able to infect first the sponsor and later the network program people with my enthusiasm for them and my belief in them. As a matter of fact, uh, I Spy, not I Spy, uh, Dick Van Dyke was canceled at the end of its first year. This is a fact that very few people remember. People mostly tend to remember it as one of the most glamorous comedy shows in recent television. What they don't remember is that it was, in fact, canceled at the end of its first year because uh, it got off. As I say, all of my shows get off to a relatively so slow start. I'm not proud of it. It's just the way it is. Uh, it had been canceled, and I was successful in getting the head of advertising for Procter & Gamble, Mr. A. Halverstad, 
to go along with it and to renew it for a second year. And he said, and I remember his statement ver almost uh, verbatim, at the end of a long harangue, after which I, during which I had been down on one knee singing Mammy and uh, doing the whole bit, uh, at the end of it, he said, well, I'll go along with it. I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you believe in the show, as I do. He says, no, I don't believe in the show. I think it should be canceled. But I believe in your belief in it. And that was good enough. It got on the air. It had a chance to make its mark. Uh, and other shows. I don't want to duplicate the example because um, the same kind of thing happened many times. I, uh, in the case of uh, one brief duplication, a guy, I had an almost similar experience with the president of the NBC network in the case of I Spy. Uh, I told you before about my, my uh, belief that we'd get a station lineup. The man who accepted that belief was Mr. Bob Kintner, who was then the president of the, of the, of the network. And I Spy went on the air because a person, a specific person, would accept the responsibility for making the decision. I'm happy to say that he accepted that responsibility because of the influence I was able to exert on him as a result of our friendship and our previous background. At any rate, he did accept the responsibility. A worthwhile show had a chance to have a career. Uh, recently, during this season, which is still in progress, I put a show on the air called Accidental Family. I believed in this show very much. By the way, forgive me if it sounds pretentious, but I believe in many of these modest little half-hour shows that I do because I believe that they each in their own way carried television a step further in its evolution towards a worthwhile theatrical form. And I believe, by the way, that television was getting there. Television is better, perceptibly better, it's getting slow, was getting slowly but perceptibly better as a result of these advances, as a result of the fact that sponsors and presidents were making decisions that went against the, the, the ratings and the numbers occasionally. There is, after all, still on the air a show that represents the continuing influence of one of the few sponsors left in the business. The Bell Telephone Hour is still on the air because the managers of the account believe that there is a public for good music and uh, the numbers aren't terribly important. They, at whatever cost to them, they're going to continue to give good music to the public until the public catches up with them. One of the few surviving examples of that kind of procedure. Uh, but when Accidental Family went on the air last uh, fall, last September, in my opinion, it represented a forward step. It was a show about a divorced woman who was living with a man to, in, a, in a home with a man to whom she was not married. And the children knew about how babies were born. They didn't know any of the fictions about cabbage leaves and something. The girl lived on a farm and was able to tell the other young, the boy uh, in the show, quite literally what happened, or as literally as her vocabulary permitted. And uh, they, uh, everything wasn't pure and, and sweet, and sometimes a kid could hate his parents without anything worth shaking, world shaking happening. And this was, believe me, a modest advance in television terms. I don't mean to say that this was a cataclysmic change, but it was the kind of minor change by which evolution occurs. It was the kind of thing that I had been seen happening in television uh, with, with some enjoyment. It was the kind of thing that made me consider television my career. Well, Accidental Family was canceled, canceled very abruptly because it was opposite of motion picture and because it did not yield an immediate return because it wasn't the flying nun or some other gimmick that caused people to tune in out of curiosity because it required a little time to grow. It required people to say, hey, did you see this show on Friday night? Tune it in. It's worth your while. It required the time that takes and the network could not give it that time any longer because the affiliates deserted in a pack. The affiliates are trembling on the brink of a desertion always because of the phenomenon that it now represents the monster that is going to drive me out of television uh, uh, eventually, feature pictures. Feature pictures came into the situation. Now, the affiliates could program feature pictures just as well as the network. They didn't need a network to feed them feature pictures because they're available in syndication. You can buy them in lots of a half a dozen from many merchants who peddle them out of suitcases or uh, other sources. You can get, as an affiliate, you can get all the feature pictures you need. They won't be as fresh and they won't be as, um, as immediate, 
as the network shows are, but you can get features. You don't need the network to play features. You do need the network to play Bonanza. You can't get it. You do need the network to play I Spy. You can't get it. But you don't need them to play features. Therefore, as soon as a time spot didn't yield an immediate and big, fat return in terms of a viewer audience, the affiliates canceled. They backed out and booked their local feature pictures. Therefore, Accidental Family, which needed the time, couldn't get it and went down the drain. Therefore, I look at this whole industry now with a jaundiced eye because I do not intend to do gimmicky shows about the mermaid from the bottom of the sea who comes up and becomes a suburban housekeeper in, in Pasadena. <laughs> I do not intend to do those things because I don't understand them. I'm not knocking them. I work within a certain frame of reference. What I do, I measure as good or bad to the degree that it relates to truth. Don't take me too literally. I don't mean to say that all of these shows are intended to be documentary, but they are intended to be illuminating. They are intended not to violate your credi uh, credibility too much. And because of that, I am not equipped to work and function in a medium in which everything has to happen right now. You have to get your attention with a startling or outrageous statement immediately and hold your attention. Uh, by the way, that's almost a contradiction in terms. I'm, I'm not the most coherent speaker, as you have by now learned, but uh, <laughs> if you will indulge me, I will sometimes follow these, these uh, inviting and interesting byways that open up from a statement I make. Uh, it is almost a contradiction in terms for a show with great novelty appeal to also to have dur durability. By its very nature, this is a phenomenon that's very observable in, na in nature, too. The, the, the quick ripening organism is also a quick fading organism. The organism which takes longest to mature tends to be the most durable. And this is true in television, too. Those shows which take the longest to establish themselves are very likely to be the longest in, in uh, tenure on the air. And if you want specific examples of that, we can go on endlessly about it. Uh, but accept it, please, as, as, a, as a truth, as a truism. With, there's only one exception I can think of. is one I still don't understand, uh, and that's a show called The Beverly Hillbillies. It's an extraordinarily good show, and it will go on just as long as they choose to keep it on the air, and yet its original appeal was a novelty appeal. Here's this company, of, this group of hillbilly millionaires that come to live in Beverly Hills. It's strictly gimmicky, but there it is in its seventh year, and it shows every promise of being able to go on as long as it wants to. We'll talk about that sometime. I have no answers. If you have, I'm interested in it. Uh, at any rate, I am now... I believe that the, that the, the evolution, the development of, of, uh, of uh, television into a medium in which I can take pride, as I have in the past taken pride in some of, some of its accomplishments, not all of them, uh, I believe that that development is being arrested by the present condition in which a show must, have, must be a novelty or it hasn't a chance. This condition is brought about by the fact that the individuals who could make decisions have been forced out of the business by the dominance of feature pictures. There are no longer sponsors or network heads who can make decisions on their own authority. And because of that, I may take it and run. <laughs> uh, that's the general framework. That's the, 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 the uh, what I intended to be my opening remarks. They've gone on a good deal longer than respectable opening remarks should, but Perhaps they will provoke some questions for you, from you. If they do, maybe we can find ourselves investigating some other areas of interest to you. Yes. Why hmm? all oh, questions? Well, it would have been it would have been vulgar for me to put it that way. But the proper way for me to put it was to say I'm going to take my money and run. Oh. <laughs> so. Out of television, per se, I, I uh, have been timidly investigating some feature picture projects. I still, it is still my business, my craft. I still uh, hope to exercise whatever skills I may have acquired in the use of a camera on the telling of a story. But I will exercise them if I am permitted to in another area. Unless something quite surprising happens in, in uh, television in the next year or two. I give it another year or two to make good with me. <laughs> yes.
a lot of the problems that you've talked about have seen, at least from the picture I've got, they're centered around the sponsors. I read all these horrible stories of independent producers that come up with a good show, get a good person to star in it, take it to some megalithic sponsor like General Foods and say, well, yeah, it's funny, it's a good show, but we'll sell Jell-O. And uh, the picture you presented is sort of an opposite one. And I'm wondering, how did this situation come about? You might, uh, forgive me, I, 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 know I thought you'd finish. I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, you might just as well say that when one says LSD is a good thing, one is taking an opposite point of view because there are so many reasons to say it's a bad thing. Uh, and both statements are true. It is a good and a bad thing. And it is, of course, both statements are true, that sponsors were good and bad. Sponsors were responsible for many evils, I believe, that they were, uh, in commercial television, as long as we must have commercial television, and whenever we investigate the evils of television, we're going to come back to that one fact, that one immovable fact, which is that it is a commercial enterprise. Uh, as long as we're going to have commercial television, I believe it is better to be able to have access to it through a variety of doors, which is what the sponsor represented, than it is to have access to it through only a few doors, which is what happened when the sponsor backed out, and you had to get, you had to seduce uh, Jim Aubrey at CBS or Tom Moore at ABC or Bob Kintner at NBC in order to get on the air. And if you struck out three times, you were out of the ballpark. Previously, before that had happened, if you didn't make it with General Foods, maybe you'd make it with uh, with P and G or with uh, Buick or somebody else. Yes, sir. Uh, how I hate them, but I think they're <coughs> indispensable. I hate them because there should be, and there are, other yardsticks. Let's not for the moment debate their accuracy because that's a pointless debate. I was convinced at the World's Fair in New York City some years ago, there was an IBM exhibit that convinced me that the Nielsen ratings probably have as good a chance of an accurate measurement as anything has. It was an IBM exhibit that showed how random sampling creates a consistently similar profile. You know, the ping pong balls of different colors which were blown up in the air and they fell into slots and the slots in the middle of the area collected more ping pong balls and the ones at the end collected fewer. Eventually they made a profile of a few ping pong balls at each end and more in the center. And it was amazing to see that that random uh, profile, that random selection, <coughs> duplicated itself endlessly, endlessly, hour after hour and day after day. Because they'd release the ping pong balls and start all over again. It would build the same pattern. <coughs> this. If nothing else had convinced me, this c convinced me that random sampling is indeed a scientific way to evaluate uh, a quantitative measurement that you can't get by other systems, by actual door-to-door -door measurement. But quantitative measurements are perhaps one of the greatest evils of the commercialism of television. What's happened to qualitative evaluations? You know, what's, happening to, what's happened to saying the show hasn't got great numbers, but it's got great quality, therefore it deserves to survive? If the same yardstick existed in the magazine publishing medium, there would be no Fortune magazine. There'd only be Life <coughs> and perhaps Time and uh, Newsweek. There would be none of the other specialized publications with a specialized appeal and the, that satisfies specialized needs. But those you, fortune survives in spite of its highly specialized appeal because there is a qualitative index. It's the medium you use in which you, if you want to sell yachts. You know, you don't advertise yachts in Time magazine. You advertise them in Fortune. It's the medium you use if you want to sell the high expensive and high quality products, uh, Scott Sound Systems or what have you. Uh, there is really no such qualitative index in television, and that's what I have against Nielsen. Not that they are inaccurate, but that you live or die by Nielsen, and that's wrong. There should be qualitative uh, measurements as well. Yes? Probably one of the reasons for the success of the feature on, on uh, TV is the fact that uh, they're usually uh, two or three months in, in uh, production, multi-million dollar pictures. Now, as the networks are running out of features, 
and as they're now turning towards making their own features, don't you think they'll come a day when uh, we dictate the budget and they have to make a feature in, say, six days, uh, will all of a sudden extend uh, a half-hour show or the quality of a half-hour show to, say, a 90-minute show, and the public will get tired of features on TV? Yes. Do you think TV, TV will go then? I then believe that, t that TV will resume its progress towards evolving a form of its own. Yes, you're quite right. I don't believe in these featurettes at all. I don't believe, uh, it's for the same reason I didn't believe in paid television, which is now pretty nearly a dead issue, but uh, I didn't believe in it because paid television was based on the premise that if you paid more for it, it would be better, which is not necessarily true. You know, it assumed that as soon as more money was available, a new pool of talent would be tapped, and that's not true. Uh, but I believe that television was making its way towards evolving a form. Uh, to bring this, the, what, this matter of form into focus, permit me to point out the obvious, which was that it took feature pictures some while to evolve their form, that you could not literally translate a play to the sound stages and photograph it in its uh, on the stage form and have a satisfactory picture. You gotta make certain modifications, certain adaptations. The primitive adaptations were to, as they say, open it up. Well, we've learned that there, there's more to it than that. We've learned there's a great deal more to it, and that's a huge <coughs> subject that we can only go into under specialized circumstances, and I don't want to get into now. But it's obvious, I'm sure, to all of you that there had to be adaptations to find what cinema was, what it could and couldn't do, and what was best for it. Television is undergoing the same process of finding out what it can and can't do. It's television is now coming to learn to understand why you're better off with Dick Van Dyke or with Andy Griffith than you are with Robert Taylor or Rock Hudson. Uh, they're coming to understand this. They're coming to understand the peculiar nature of the medium and the differences in story structure. They're coming to understand why... I can open a feature picture with a photograph of a leaf floating downstream and take 10 minutes investigating the birds on the limbs before I start my story, but when I start a television show, I better get two people killed and three kidnapped before the titles come on, <laughs> or you've gone someplace else. They are learning that there is a specific difference in form. They are learning that you are watching, they're not learning, they are observing and, and, and uh, gaining some benefit from analyzing the fact that you watch television under special circumstances, not in a temple that you go into and where you sacrifice your individuality when you give up the ticket and you become Im immersed in what's happening on the screen and, uh, and participate in it vicariously. Where you have also made a major investment. You've gotten the car out of the garage and you've driven there and you've parked and you've stood in line. And if you don't like it, you have no dial to turn to get something else. You've got to sit there while the director takes his own sweet time in determining to tell you when his story starts. You can't afford to be impatient with him. You've got too much of an investment. With me, when I start a television show, if you don't like the way I've started it, you've pressed that remote control button five times before <laughs> I've had a chance to draw a breath. Uh, so I, I, I must tell it in a different way. Also, I must tell it in a different way when I realize that there are going to be five commercial interruptions. I can't expect your undivided attention. Somebody's going to be flushing a toilet next door right on a key line. <laughs> Somebody, your wife is going to call in and say, aren't you going to help with the dishes? Or you're going to get up for a beer or whatnot. I can't get the same degree of immersion, the same degree of concentration, the same degree of pure attention. Hitchcock, when he told a story, hid what he called the MacGuffin in an early part of the story. The term MacGuffin, if you're interested, I'll come back to it later. It's a, a picturesque term which he used particularly. Uh, in an early part of the story and then disregarded it. Uh, if I do that and I spy... Audiences are totally confused because they, they don't remember what the story is about. The same point must be made with greater clarity and with greater emphasis and with greater frequency in order to register on a television audience which has diffused attention under special circumstances than in a the theater, and so on. At any rate, we were evolving towards an understanding of these phenomena. We were uh, evolving towards an adaptation towards it. It is hard to, to understand at first, at first, later it's clear, why small problems, what is the reason for the durability of a show like the, the, the Nelsons, Ozzie and Harriet Nelson? The greatest problem they ever coped with was that the fellow didn't do his homework, I think. <laughs> I think it's the greatest thing, is low-key, totally low-key plays, and yet year after year they went on. 
Uh, and the answer is, of course, identification. The answer is that if you watch it under those circumstances, under those particular domestic circumstances, identification with small problems is easier. You go into the, that, that, that temple that I spoke of before, and as Lawrence tracks through the, the endless wastes of the desert, <laughs> by God, you're with him. You're perspiring and you're cringing under the heat with him. I can't, no, no way I can accomplish that on a television screen. I don't aim at it. There's no way I can get that degree of identification on the television screen. No way I can make you cringe from a blow, as I could literally do with a big screen at my command. I could literally make you physically share the impact of a blow. It's not a tough thing, either in storytelling terms or in technical terms, to accomplish. Can't do it. Don't attempt to do it in television. In television, we seek an identification with things that are in a, a much narrower range, much closer to what you understand. And that, by the way, is why a Dick Van Dyke is a great deal more acceptable li than the god like Bob Taylor is. You know, he's more in the range of experience of most people of uh, big middle America. That is why it is so difficult to make a show go with a foreign protagonist. Accents are death for, 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 for mass acceptance on television. Why? Because while accents may be familiar to metropolitan dwellers, they are not familiar to the so-called heartland of the country. There is no identification with it. There, there, there is no relationship to it. And so on through many, many generalizations, some of which I'm sure have value, many which are questionable. But at least we were coming to understand that this was a special thing we were dealing with that could do special things. And, and learning how to handle these tools that were put at our disposal when they invented the electronic camera. Yes, the lady back there. Dick Van Dyke went off the air because everybody was much too successful. Uh, Dick Van Dyke's show was a special kind of, of success. It was a, a big prestige success as well as a financial success. It led to offers to, to Dick. Uh, Dick was making... Uh, I don't know if the, I trust that I'm speaking off the record here because I'm speaking with the freedom that uh, I prefer to use on the assumption that whatever quoting is done will be done in academic environments, not in the public press. Uh, and with that assumption, I, I, I'll proceed to say Dick, Dick was making out of the Van Dyke show at the greatest point, he earned something like $95,000 a season which is not to be sneezed at, but that's on the basis of something plus $3,000 per episode plus. Because when we got Dick, he was, he was a very reasonable actor. He was not well known. And uh, I think we started him at something like 2000 per episode, something in that area. I don't remember the figures accurately. Anyway, they served to illustrate my point. Uh, as he became popular, Disney offered him a picture deal where he was to make in a where he was guaranteed 350000 a year, minimum guarantee for Disney, and was still free to go take pictures elsewhere. Dick is now making, I would guess, he's grossing. Uh, the term gross is important because there are many subsidiary expenses that dilute the gross very substantially. But Dick, I would say, is grossing for his personal services somewhere in the area of a million and a half now per year. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore was offered an immediate contract with Review, also at a simul similarly spectacular increase in, in uh, price. Carl Reiner, who was the producer and head writer on it, was offered a picture career, again, at more money for less work. Uh, so, as soon as their contract... The, when you draw television contracts, they're drawn for five years. After that, you have to renegotiate them. So, when the contracts expired, there was no chance of renegotiating same thing, of course, will be true with Bill Cosby when his contract to uh, I Spy expires. There's no possible chance of renegotiating it because his, his earning capacity is far, far beyond anything that, that, uh, that we can offer him or hope to achieve for him in television. Yes? All I, all I can express are my hopes for it. Uh... <coughs> I, I hope that it can be a very important and uh, uh, very well managed and very well administered aspect of television because as a visual aid, it's, uh, television is incomparable. I don't know the field too well. It is at present uh, for the great part in incompetent hands and uh, so it will too will have to go through 
transition periods. But uh, I hope it becomes a very important element. Yes? How do you deal with from, uh, <laughs> well, with a little luck, a lot of planning, a lot of ingenuity. Our success with location has been the result of um, a lot of pre-planning, great deal of pre-planning, violation of many, many concepts, of, uh, the violation of many rules, re uh, making new rules. Uh, first rule that we disregarded was that um, uh, I bought scripts before the show was bought, before the show was ordered. In order to be able, if I spy is renewed next year, and right the moment these decisions are being made in New York, I trust it will be renewed. It's uh, certain problems in the way of its renewal. It's not as easy as it might seem because there are available time spots. I don't want to go at 10 o'clock at night anymore. There are very few earlier time spots available. And we're going through that. That's not your problem. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, uh, uh, I buy, even, even though the show is not yet renewed, I've already invested something like $90,000 in stories for next year. These stories are being broken down. The first group of 10 or so pertain to locations in and around London, a few in and around Edinburgh and Scotland, a couple up in um, Copenhagen. Uh, they are bought. They are being broken down. Location manager, even before the show, show is renewed, will have to go into these areas and select the specific locations and make the commitments and engage the people and do the preparation work for us. All of this in order to make it work. So advance preparation, particularly advance in the matter of story, is terribly important. Recognition of the fact that none of the old rules hold is also important. There's nothing wrong. The increased use of the handheld camera has made locations much more feasible. Uh, willingness to compromise in the purity of sound is also very important. A readiness to use 16 millimeter when 35 millimeter won't do it is also important. But all of these things are, again, the result of a revision of values. You see, most of the values that television carried over were values that were established for theatrical film. The rigid tripod mounted, uh, mounted camera is part of the theatrical film concept where you've got a wide picture and that much, the most minute uh, vibrations in the camera just from holding it against your, your, your heartbeat will cause enough vibration in a handheld camera to show up on a big screen because that minute microscopic variation that occurs as you hold the camera here becomes ma m magnified into something perhaps two feet in scope on the theatrical screen. And it was true that this is a bad thing, disconcerting on the whole unless used in special circumstances. Sound in the, in the theater bad sound, background, traffic noise in the background, very disconcerting. But on the television screen, hell, you got more variation when somebody turned on an electric shaver next door. So to be excessively concerned about that was foolish. Sound, again, you're, you're looking at it as most of the country does with outdated, badly serviced sets, they were getting more interference than we could build into the pictures. So to respect... <laughs> So to respect those prohibitions was self-limit, was a limitation that we didn't have to observe. So we went out and we shot it where we could get it. We held the camera in the hand. When we had to, we did with traffic noises when we couldn't eliminate them. We, we used ingenuity and we used, some of my people used an incredible amount of pure physical courage to get pictures. It's been, oh God, such a challenge and such a rewarding experience too, in many ways. Uh, but uh, we've learned a lot and uh, I, I welcome locations, the most difficult ones I welcome. Yes? Probably not. Because pilots are usually a bad form of storytelling. Uh, the best form of storytelling, for my dough, is the kind in which you start with a provocative subject or statement and then pre proceed to develop it. Uh, in doing a pilot, you've got to do it in a very bad, you've got to explain who everybody is and where they came from. Instead of com spending your time telling the story, once your series is started, you no longer have to tell that the hillbillies had a lot of oil and they came here to Beverly Hills and they looked for a house and they sat down. You don't have to tell that all over again. They do, as a matter of fact, with the introductory song, but that's not necessary. You no longer have to go into those details. But in the pilot, you have to go into all the painful elucidation of background and details, and your story doesn't get started until somewhere in like two-thirds of the way through. In addition to which, it has become increasingly the practice to sell a salted mine in the case of a pilot. 
to take a pilot, and where your series budget is going to be perhaps $80,000 on a half-hour show, to spend, as in the case of Rat Patrol, up to $400,000 in the making of a pilot, then it is just misrepresentation, which would not be permitted in other commercial areas, to take that pilot and go in and say, this is the kind of show I intend to deliver to you each week. Uh, I don't, well, many reasons, that's amongst them. Yes, sir. <laughs> don't think we haven't coped with that question many times but uh, the only way I can answer you is by to examine the terms in which you ask that question uh, I d I'm, I'm not aware that I said that I won't have anything to do with things that, that don't have a high degree of feasibility that term is relative uh, and also flexible and feasibility is a, a term which I don't quite know how to use. I spoke of keeping things in a framework of credibility, which perhaps serves the same fr purpose. And again, that framework of credibility is an elastic one which expands or contracts according to the subject. Again, use the, the, the example of Spy Who Came In From The Cold at one end of the spectrum and James Bond at the other end of the spectrum. You have different frames of credibility. Now, that would seem to be a cop-out answer, except for the fact that what I'm going to say now is the total answer, which is that my connection with Goma Pyle is a third-generation connection. I did not choose it. It is a necessary connection because of the fact that it evolved from the Andy Griffith show, which in turn evolved from the Danny Thomas show. I was the creator and manager of the Danny Thomas show. I was the creator of the Andy Griffith show. I was not the creator of Goma Pyle, but Goma Pyle was... A, an offspring of uh, Andy Griffith, and therefore I retain certain proprietary rights in it by contractual references. It's not of my creation, nor do I accept any major responsibility for it. I will accept the responsibility for good taste and certain other areas, but uh, as for that aspect of credibility, that's not, I don't consider that my problem. Yes? I said the affiliates. Right. I came down to the affiliates, not the networks. Uh, it's an important difference. Forgive me for interrupting you, but it is an important difference. I corrected you because I thought that your question was going up the garden path, as forgive me, it has. <laughs> uh, I made a point of the fact that they were the affiliates and not the networks. The term, the terms are such dangerous things. You know, What are networks? Networks are a combination of buildings on Rockefeller Plaza and people in offices and typewriters and various other things. It comes down to people that we're talking about. Now, the uh, affiliates are individuals. No individual has the power to make a decision. Just like no one ant can strip a carcass to the bone. But an army of them can. And the same thing with the affiliates. No one affiliate can make have any influ influence on policy. But the totally, the, the aggregate number of them has an enormous influence on policy. So since there is no one person to make the decisions, I think that answers your question. Yes, sir. Did Fred tell us? I'm not entirely sure because that was a CBS situation and, and uh, uh, since my early days with Jim Aubrey I have not been very close to CBS I uh, didn't have a mine was a stormy relationship with Mr. Aubrey uh, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm pretty sure he did that's the way it would be yes, it would be like that yes Do think so? You mean on the air? The question never entered my mind. I never, never evaluated in those terms as to whether they would have literary merit. I'm sure they have, but they are just not a TV form. TV deserves the time and the opportunity to evolve its own form. 
No, I hope maybe my career will be involved in theater, in, in the, theatrical film and features. But uh, I, uh, I don't believe that that's the right form for television. Yes. No, I don't, th I don't know anyone who's qualified to make them. They would be accepted very rapidly if they were provided, but I don't know any. Making a half-hour show is a very difficult and demanding thing, which demands skills that are quite rare, becoming rarer. And uh, I don't know. I wouldn't be able to put together an organization that could make a respectable week-after-week-hour comedy. I wouldn't know how to. Yes. give you a generalized yes, generalized only because I would not want to be so specific as to say the most creative area. Certainly one of the more rewarding areas is the documentary and the proper use thereof. Yes, certainly. Will we see more things like that four-hour show? Yes. Yes, I hope so. I think so. Yes. Now, I must reject an assumption that's implicit in your question. Uh, I don't think it is failing to meet its responsibilities towards communications. I think it has done very well in that area, in, in, in communications, in, in letting you in on history as it's happening. I think it's done very well. I think it will do better. Uh, I think the area of failure is in the entertainment area. The two are not the same, although they use the same apparatus to exist. They are really very distant cousins. Uh, news, current events, and communications, and entertainment. They are not the same. It's having a present effect right now. It will have a long-range effect, I think, that uh, involves certain technical understandings that uh, may not be appropriate for this kind of a meeting. It is like likely to lead to the disintegration of the networks and to the, therefore, greater importance of syndication. That is, the door-to-door -door distribution. Of, to look for an analogy, which may be more in your experience, it may have the same relationship to broadcasting that the divorcement of production, motion picture production companies from theater ownership had some years ago. It changed the whole pattern of picture making. It increased the number of independents, increased the importance of exploitation, and diminish the power of the individual producers. Yes. I noticed this afternoon in your talk you hesitate, or I don't know if you hesitate, but you never use the word art. Do you feel that uh, the television is an art form? And if so, what criteria? Um, I think it's a pretentious term used in this context. Uh, perhaps I refrain from using it because I respect it so much. Uh, I think, I don't know, uh, yes, on, on the cinema, frequently the expression on the screen has approached an art form, in my opinion. I don't recall anything in television that deserves that accolade. Uh, when we use the term art, means something different, I guess, to everyone who hears it, and perhaps we'd better define it. Uh, I'd like to differentiate it from storytelling. You know, go, uh, storytelling could be, I suppose, at a certain point, could deserve to be described as art. Of course, Shakespeare was an art, artist, a uh, great artist as a storyteller. Many others are. Uh, but I don't think that storytelling in any form that I have seen it on television was of such extraordinary 
power, such extraordinary merit as to deserve that term. I don't say, say I, I believe that in order to aim for art in television, we would have to forego commercialism. I don't think the two are compatible. Maybe a cynical conclusion, I don't know, I don't think so. NEC would try, but there again you come against one of the sordid paradoxes of, of the show business. The, the well-meaning people of NEC don't have the talent. The talent is in the commercial theater. Uh, the talent is well paid for. Television goes where, talent goes where the money is. Tal talent doesn't go into NET if it can do better. Talent doesn't come into uh, any of the uh, areas of our business that uh, doesn't have to unless, uh, I was about to say a terrible thing, I'll pass it. Did I say that? Are you about to call television a gimmick? I thought you were. I thought that's where you got. I don't believe it's any more of a gimmick than the telephone is or than electric light is. I believe it's it's uh, an essential and by now essential part of our culture. I believe it will be essential worldwide in our time. Uh, I, I don't believe it's in any sense a gimmick. I don't understand Marshall McLuhan. <laughs> I've given him every chance to make good. <laughs> I just don't understand it. Uh, no, I think he's an enchanting uh, word user, but uh, I don't know what he's getting at. Yes? Most playhouses are... Playhouse, an anthology, starts out with an enormous advantage. It has unlimited scope. You don't have to... When you do a series, when you bring your writers in, you start out by telling them what they can't do. See, uh, you, um, uh, you can't uh, do this with Culp and Cosby, and you can't do this, and you can't go in this situation. We've done that one before, and you can't do the other one. A lot of, a lot of uh, negative statements. But when you do an anthology, do anything. Do fantasy, do comedy, do anything you want to. So it's produces better entertainment. Now, it hasn't been commercially successful because of one of the peculiarities of television, which is it doesn't develop a loyalty to any single person. You know, it's, you're not, it's not like you watch. You went in to watch Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore every week. You didn't go in to watch the show or the stories. You went to watch them. It was a personal relationship built up. And the anthology doesn't do that. Now, there are certain devices which give you many of the advantages of an anthology and still give you the, the, the opportunity to develop the privilege of continuing characters, and that is the kind of anthology that's represented by something like Wagon Train. It's basically, basically an anthology, you know? It's an anthology in one predetermined and continuing environment, but it's still an anthology. Grand Hotel is an anthology. Ship of Fools is an anthology. See, these shows contain within the body, within the environment they, they, they provide, many different stories. It is possible to do a series with continuing characters, and still to have the advantages of an anthology, but it has not often been done. Yes? Yes? Sometimes the answer is yes and no. <laughs> uh, uh, Culp didn't have to do a lot of convincing because I first met him as a writer and knew that he was a, an excellent writer. He had to do a lot of convincing before I let him direct, and then I did it not merely to because I believed in him as a director, because it was one of the quieter ways, ways of keeping the beasts content. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, there's a certain amount of of, uh, of gamesmanship, a certain amount of compromise involved. Disney doesn't ha Disney when he was alive didn't have to deal with these problems. When he was dealing with pen and ink figures. It was fine, but dealing with people as you do and as I do, you come up against continual, they, 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 they dominate much of your life, much of your time, much of your planning. I'm going to give as much time, 
I'm very likely to give as much time to deciding what kind of accommodations to get for Cosby's wife and his baby if we hit some of the Scottish small villages outside of Edinburgh, how we're going to get boiled water and so on for the babies. I, I may give as much time to that problem as I do to the question of whether to shoot in a castle outside of Glasgow or, or someplace else. Yes. I, <laughs> I guess talk shows were as good as the talk. The, the, uh, the era of good talk has passed. The era of good talk may not reappear in our time because the respect for language has disappeared. Read some of these Renaissance plays, some of the Elizabethan, some, read old literature, even not even that old, as recent as Mark Twain, and, and bathe in the richness of the words, of the language, of the imagery. And uh, then inspect the kind of language we use today, the graceless, awkward use of the language, the purely utilitarian use of it. The language is no longer used ornamentally, as it were. Very few do it. A guy like Frank Baxter does it occasionally. There are very few who, who respect language for its beauty as well as for its uh, ability to communicate. And uh, until a respect for language uh, reoccurs, there will be not much good talk. There will be a lot of utilitarian talk, as Dean Rusk explains why we are escalating or de-escalating. But this is purely utilitarian. But talk for its own sake, for the sake of, of listening to people say things well, that is not likely to happen again in our time. Yes? I, th I think I know what a director does in uh, mm -hmm. working with you know, I believe in this business that I've been in so many years, uh, you develop a sense of communication with audiences. You must become aware of them, or else you don't know whether you're pleasing them or not. By the way, that's a, uh, an aspect of equipment for doing this business that's rapidly becoming obsolete, because as actors, directors, and writers I'll get, get more and more removed from their audiences by technology, there is a gradually or rapidly d diminishing awareness of how you communicate with audiences. In its simplest form, this may seem like a, r a very long about answer to your question, I'll get back to it in a moment. Uh, in its simplest form, the old vaudeville entertainers doing five a day in front of matinee audiences and evening audiences, knew how they were doing. They got seven bows or they got eight bows or they took two bows or whatnot or they died and they, they, they had the effect of it and they weren't doing well. They did something about the act. They juiced it up. And we still have hangovers from those days, the Jack Bennies and the George Burnses and a few others. Uh, then the, the, the relationship with the audience became more and more remote. When I got into it, I got into it by way of the legitimate theater and Broadway and there was still a high degree of communication eight times a week matinees on Wednesday and Saturday and evening performances, and you, you either did well and you sensed it, you, the volume of your laughs, the frequency of them. Then I got into audience radio here with Jack Benny and Bob Hope and the others, and again, you had audiences there who told you how you were doing. Over a period of time, you developed this umbilical cord that connected you with the audience so that you sensed their restlessness or the absence thereof, and you could anticipate and that preamble, my friend, is the answer to the how I knew that you were going to ask what a producer does. Because <laughs> I knew that's where you're going, because it's one of the <coughs> very frequently asked questions usu is usually prefaced by a statement of understanding of directors and so on. What does a producer do? A producer bears the same relationship to a theatrical project that the architect does to a building. The architect gets a concept. The architect seldom draws the plans himself, but he knows what man should draw the plans. The architect should be able to draw the plans himself if called upon. The ideal producer should be able to fix the script if he doesn't know who can do it better. The ideal producer should be able to take over the direction if the director isn't doing what he wants. But short of the ideal, he should know the pe proper people to do each job and supervise their doing of it. Like the great architects, uh, it seems to me, not knowing too much about architecture, that the analogy is a valid one. The great architect looks at a piece of land and 
forms a concept what kind of building would go with that piece of land. Communicates that concept to somebody who can then translate it into lines on paper. Then carries the concept further to where he has gotten the city council to adopt the funds for it. Then can, does all the necessary steps to turn an idea into a concrete reality. And the producer, under the best conditions, should do the same thing. Yes, there are other, you know, all kinds of producers, all kinds of people do all kinds of jobs. And there are producers who merely do the assigned task. Producers you hire and say, get me a show out each week. I'll give you the scripts. Don't worry about them. Keep the costs down. Producers who are skillful in management and that alone. I have tended to go more with producers who are skillful in story evocation. I don't particularly care about how well my producers manage their shows. I'll get somebody who can do that for them quite reasonably and very good at it. If they can evoke stories, if they can communicate with writers and get good stories, I'll be good catalysts towards writers. And I've taken up far, far more of your time than I'm entitled to. And I thank you very much. And I want to thank you, Mr. Leonard, for taking time out of your busy schedule and, and coming here and sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. Thank you.